Hallelujah. Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy. That you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. We took part one of this message last week Sunday. We could not finish the message and uh, we are going to have part two of it today. And we are believing God that we shall complete this particular episode in the series Watch and Pray. Last Sunday, we mentioned that the series of teachings we are doing can only make sense to anyone whose goal in life is eternal life. The series Watch and Pray, which we started a few weeks ago, with Watch and Pray unto Perseverance, that was part two. Watch and Pray so that you do not fall into temptation. And then we did Watch and Pray, you do not know the time. And part four of it, watch and pray so that you may be counted worthy to escape. All this series can only make sense to an individual whose goal in life is eternal life. Anyone whose goal in life is to make money or to have a good time or to be a celebrity. And then hoping that somehow he will arrive in heaven. This series will not make sense to you. Because it is directly opposite everything that you desire. The Lord makes it clear. Some things are going to happen on the face of the earth. And they are already happening. And is calling his people, watch, be alert, be awake. Do not be spiritually, sl do not spiritually slumber so that you can escape. We mentioned last Sunday that the escape that the Lord is talking about is not just to escape being killed. Do not restrict this to, oh, I have escaped danger. Boko Haram did not kill me. Kidnapper did not capture me. Uh, Fulani headsman did not kill me. Arm robber did not kill me. I have escaped. No, it is more than that. You can escape being killed, but you can be caught in perversion of this age. You can be caught in covetousness of this age. You can be captured by the immorality of this age. All those things disqualify from eternal life. So when you watch and pray, you watch for physical danger, you watch out for spiritual danger, you watch out for immorality. The Bible points out that there are three enemies of spiritual alertness. And the three are mentioned in verse 34. Surfeiting, drunkenness, and cares of this life. Those three will make you lose spiritual 
alertness. We shall continue this morning and remind us that the end times have two aspects to it. When the Bible is talking about the end, when God talks about the end of the age, there are two aspects to it. The first one is the day of the rapture. And the rapture that leads to Armageddon, seven years after. Maybe one day, we should revisit the, vis uh, the message on end times. If the rapture takes place today, then Armageddon unfailingly is taking place seven years from now. Unfailingly. So the rapture signals the end of the age. And then Armageddon follows. And 1,000 years after Armageddon, the white throne judgment follows. From that time, from the date of the rapture, you can now begin to know exactly when what is going to happen next in the end time. What we don't know is the day of the rapture. So that is one aspect of the end. The other aspect of the end is the day you die. Then, for that individual, the end has come. He is no longer waiting for rapture before he enters the end of the age. Anybody who dies today, he, his end has come. He has entered the end of the age. For him, it is over. So you don't know the day of the rapture. None of us knows. And you don't know the day you are going to die. Nobody knows. There are three things that we do not know. And I am going to list the three. And I am very sure you cannot answer one of the three. Number one. You don't know when you are going to die. Number two. You don't know where you are going to die. Number three, you don't know the kind of death that will kill you. None of us knows that. Nobody knows. When you are going to die, you don't know. You can say, I will not die in the next 50 years. And in the next five minutes, you are gone. Because electricity shocked you. Or because you fall down suddenly. Or because a vehicle loses control and hits you. You are driving carefully. And the vehicle loses control. Or tire flies out from a speeding vehicle. And the tire hits you. And that's the end of the matter. I pray none of this will happen to you. I pray you will not die suddenly. But there are people who have died like this. And they are not worse sinners than any of us. So no one knows when he's going to die. Nobody knows where he's going to die. Somebody may say, I am planning my life so that I will die peacefully in my home. And he dies in a near crash. And he dies falling down from motorcycle. Or he eats something, he dies. Or he falls ill, suddenly he dies. Nobody knows when. And nobody knows the kind of death. Therefore, you must always be alert. You must always be watchful. You must always be on guard. You cannot afford to be slack. To watch and to pray 
therefore becomes crucial. You observe what is going on in your environment. Don't be narrow-minded such that all that you see is money. Money. There are Christians who right now, all they see is money. When you tell them, Boko Haram is killing people, they say, I beg, leave me alone. Have I solved all my own problem? There are Christians that you tell, oh, there are persecuted Christians in the north. Let's pray for them. I say, I beg, have I finished praying for myself? He is not watching. As far as he's concerned, his own problem is everything. And what is his problem? His needs must be met. He's not watching. Watch. So that you can escape. That verse 36 mentions two things. He says, watch therefore and pray always. Number one, that you may be accounted worthy to escape. So that you may be able to escape poisoning. You may be able to escape kidnapping. Escape terrorism. Escape robbery attack. Escape accident. Escape organ harvesting. Escape organ harvesting. There is that danger. Escape ritual killing. Then Jesus says, it's not enough that you escape and that you may stand before the Son of Man. Some people will escape, but they will not be able to stand before Jesus. And remember, we're talking about eternal life. That there is life waiting after this one you are living. You see this, our sojourn on planet Earth. That some people have taken as if their whole existence is bound up in planet Earth. Our sojourn here is a probation. It is as if you employ somebody in an office and you say, we are placing you on probation for six months. That six months, you are not a full staff. But we have given you an offer, an opportunity to report in this place of work every month and we will pay your salary, but we are watching you. We are watching you. We are observing your conduct. We are observing, assessing your performance. After six months, if we are not satisfied, we tell you to go. That you cannot be a staff. After six months, if we are satisfied, then we give you a letter of confirmation of appointment. That is probation. That is what you and I are doing on planet Earth. We have not arrived. We are not home yet. God has not accepted us yet. Whether you spend 80 years, whether you spend 100 years, you are on probation. What is 80 years compared with eternity? Let us assume that eternity is 10 billion years. And then you are given 100 years. What is 100 years compared with 10 billion? It's like somebody having 100 naira and somebody having 10 billion naira. And the person who has 100 naira says, Ah, I am rich, oh, I have 100 naira. And he's standing beside somebody with 10 billion naira. You know the way the billionaire will look at him? And eternity is more than 10 billion years. And many people are wasting their time of probation, running after what is not important. And yet... The employer is looking at you. 
It's like you place, you employ somebody on probation. And he arrives at work 9 a.m. When work resumes at 8. And he closes at 2 when office closes at 4 p.m. And during work hours he will sleep. And instead of working he will invite his friends to the office. And he's behaving anyhow. And the employer is looking at him. I said, you have six months to prove yourself. And the employer refused to sack him. The employer refused to give him query. He's just watching him. Then after six months, they say, your service is not required. And he said, why? Why? I was here for six months. They said, you were here for six months. What were you doing here for six months? That is the way some people are living their lives. And unfortunately, that is the way some Christians are living their lives. You forget you are on probation. You have not arrived. Any Christian who is living carelessly, there is no difference between you and the unbeliever who is not a Christian. You are all the same. You are all going back to the same place. Because when God will pick the people who measure up to his standard, he will throw the rest away as refuse. All that God is interested in right now is checking you to find out, are you qualified to live in my house? Are you qualified to be a member of my household, of my family? And there are so many Christians who are telling God we are not qualified. We don't care about your house. We don't care about you. Leave us to enjoy our lives. One day your probation will end though. Just know that your probation on earth will end. And that probation ends the day that you die. That is the day your soul and your spirit will leave your body. And your body, the body will return to the dust. And the soul and body and spirit will enter eternity. Then, I pray that you will be ready. Some people will escape, but they will not stand before Jesus Christ. My prayer for you this morning is that you will escape all the evils and perversions on planet earth and you will stand before Jesus Christ. You will not be disqualified in the name of Jesus. You will not die suddenly in the name of Jesus Christ. That is why watching and praying is crucial. That is why watching is crucial. And what do you watch first? And whom do you watch first? Yourself. Watch yourself. Many of us are experts in watching other people. Leave other people low. First watch yourself. If you want to criticize, first criticize yourself. If you want to assess, <clears throat> first assess yourself. How are you living? Are you living carelessly? How do you talk? Do you talk recklessly? How do you behave? Do you behave wickedly and unrighteously? Watch yourself. Is your heart tilting towards immorality? Watch yourself. Then watch the company around you. Who are the people who are around you? Because those who are around you have the capacity to influence you. That's why the Bible says that don't make friends with a wrathful person, with an angry person, or else you will learn his way. If you make friends with an immoral person, you will become immoral. If you make friends with a drug addict, you are going to be, start using drugs very soon. 
If you make drugs with a, uh, make friends with a prostitute, you will soon be a prostitute. If you are friends with a liar, you will soon start telling lies. Watch the people around you and then watch your environment. Watch. And whatever you see, use it to pray. Even for yourself, use it to pray. Therefore, brethren, be sober. Be sober. Like we mentioned last Sunday, some pastors treat the church as entertainment platform. They try to get people excited, thinking that when people are excited, they are happy, they will start, they will keep coming to church. Luko, oh, be sober. What is at stake? If you truly understand what is at stake, you will not be excited. You will be sober. And that's what Jesus Christ says. The Bible says be sober. And then, add to it, be vigilant. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He says be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary... There is an enemy that is watching you. That enemy does not want you to lay hold on eternal life. Brethren, this issue is not about money. If you are a Christian and you are still worried about money, then you don't know what Christianity means. Money is not your problem. It can never be your problem. Because you have a father who has promised that he will meet all of your needs. Go to your father in prayers. If you discover you don't have money, go to your father. Like we mentioned last Sunday, probably you are not standing in the right place. Probably. If you are a Christian, you have financial problems. Go to meet God. You are not standing in the right place. Or you are standing in the right place, you are not doing the right thing. Your needs have been met. For every son, there is inheritance. For every child of God, there is divine provision. Go to God and ask God, why am I having financial problems? Ask him. So, the issue here is eternal life. And what Satan wants to steal from you is your soul. We did that teaching where we were doing the teaching on weapons of our warfare and we touched on helmet of salvation. You can get the message again on our YouTube channel. The only thing that Satan wants to steal from you is your soul, your salvation. He's not interested in your money. If money is your problem, Satan is prepared to give you money. He's prepared to pay billions in exchange for your soul. That's the secret behind money cult. A man or a woman goes to Satan, enters into a covenant with him, and asks for money. And Satan says, take as much as you need. But when you die, your soul comes to Satan. The soul of the person comes to Satan. That's the secret behind it. So money is not your problem. The problem here, the issue here, is the salvation of your soul. Eternal life. We cannot stress it enough. Many Christians have lost soberness. Because they are trying to catch up with the lifestyle of the world. Many Christians... There are many things that Christians do that you just know this one is trying to be like the world. 
Today, it is fashionable for our wives, our women, our sisters in the church to be wearing here attachment. No matter how much you preach to some of them, they won't agree. Oh, because they must look touch. And that's what they say now. It's the French word to chain. They must look attractive. And you tell them, you are a child of God. You don't need this. They say, no, it does not matter. It is what is inside that God is looking at. If it is on the inside, if God is on the inside, he will show on the outside. God is too big for you to carry on your inside and he will not show outside. It is, it is not possible. If God is on your inside, he will show on the outside. If he doesn't show on the outside, he is not on the inside. Don't deceive yourself. The race, the hunger to be accepted by the world, to measure up with the fashion of the world, to comply with the lifestyle, to keep up with fashion, that race has made a lot of Christians lose soberness. A lot of Christians have lost carefulness. A lot of believers in Christ Jesus, they have become reckless. Ministries, pastors, church members, wives, husbands, are all joined in the race to stand out, forgetting this earth is not their home. The kingdom of the world is not their kingdom. You are in the world, you are not of the world. What adds to this problem is the pressure to show results. Brethren, let me tell you this, in case you are not aware. You are under pressure. Christian brother, Christian sister, please be aware. You are under pressure. And what is that pressure? You are under pressure to show result. Your family is placing you under pressure to show some results. Your friends are placing you under pressure to show some results. The world is placing you under pressure. Your culture is placing you under pressure. If you are not careful, you will be responding to those pressures. And those pressures are not set by God. They are set for you by the kingdom of the world. And Satan is the one firing those pressures so that you will do what you are not supposed to do. The goals that you are being pressured to meet, those goals were not set for you by God. They were set by the world. Those goals will lead you to compromise. Those goals will lead you to take the wrong decisions. Those goals will lead you to yield, to sin, will lead you to lower your standards of morality, lower your standards of virtue. Watch your desires. Watch your desires. Brethren, you are under pressure. The easiest way for you to escape that pressure, simplify your life. I say that again. Simplify your life. Live a simple life. Do not join the rat race. 
Don't join the rat race. Because if you join the rat race and you win, you are still a rat. That you have won the rat race has not changed. You are still a rat. So don't join the rat race. Simplify your life. Be content with what you have. Don't join the vanity of the world. Watch. The first person you are to watch is yourself. Remember. Remember. What is your destiny? What is the goal that God set for your life? Before you begin to run after the one Satan is setting, what is the goal that God has set for your life? There is a term that is now popular in the church. It is called destiny. In fact, our first message this year in this fellowship is what is your destiny? That seems to be what God is asking us in 2023. What is your destiny? What is your goal in life? What is your goal? And brethren, we quickly refer to what we shared in January, first Sunday in January this year. Every almost every assembly you go now, you will be hearing prayers. Pray for your destiny, my destiny, every enemy of my destiny, whoever wants to destroy my destiny. Then there is a new term, destiny helper. May God connect you with your destiny helper. May God connect you with the person who will help you to attain your destiny. It's all lies. Lies. Capital L-I-E-S. Lie from the pit of hell. Because when they are talking about destiny now, they are linking it to your career, they are linking it to your wealth, that your destiny is to be like Bill Gates, to be rich like Elon Musk, your destiny is to be a celebrity. That's all they're interpreting destiny as. In fact, when you go through the Bible, the word destiny is not there. From Genesis to Revelation, the word destiny is not there. What is in the Bible is predestinate. And predestinate appears only four times. Twice in Romans, twice in Ephesians. We will read the one in Romans. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Verse 29, Romans chapter 8. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. To be conformed to the image of his son. He predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son. Not the image of Bill Gates. Not the image of Elon Musk. Not the image of uh, Dan Gote. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. You will find predestinate also in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 11. Those are the four places in which predestinate comes up. And what are you predestinated to be? To be conformed to the image of Christ. Which means, what is your destiny? Christ-likeness. That is your destiny. Your destiny is to be like Jesus. Not to be a rich man. Not to be a celebrity. Not to be a business magnate. Not all those things that all these fake pastors are now misleading Christians to pursue. If your goal is to be like Jesus, money will not be your goal though, because money was not the goal of Jesus. If your goal is to be like Jesus, popularity will not be your goal because popularity was not the goal of Jesus. 
If your goal is to be like Jesus, doing the will of God will be your goal because that was the will of Jesus. Christ-likeness is your destiny. <clears throat> Don't allow anybody to deceive you. Christ-likeness is your destiny. If you have any destiny helper, then it means that destiny helper is helping you to be like Jesus, not connecting you to get a contract. Don't allow these fake pastors to deceive you. Go to the Bible and study it there. There is no enemy trying to destroy your destiny. Your destiny is Christ-likeness. You and I, we have the same destiny. Everybody that comes to Jesus has only one destiny. Christ-likeness. Be sober. Simplify your life. Jesus simplified his life. He lived simply. Because on planet Earth, there is nothing for us here. We are not home yet. Our home is the kingdom of God. Please, let your goal be eternal life. When your goal is eternal life, nobody needs to preach morality to you. Nobody needs to preach holiness to you. Nobody needs to preach sanctification to you. Nobody needs to tell you to give. Nobody needs to tell you to love. You know what you must do. It is when eternal life is not the goal of Christians that you have to be telling them you must be holy, you must be pure, you must be good, you must be kind. Once you make eternal life your goal, you know what you must do to gain it now. Be sober. Be vigilant. Your enemy is watching for you, but he will not catch you in the name of Jesus. Satan will not catch your soul. Satan will not destroy God's purpose for your life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We look at one or two Bible passages and then we close. First John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. First John, that is little John, chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, and every man that has this hope in him, purifies himself, even as he is pure. We are children of God. We don't know how we are going to be when we enter into eternal life. But we know that the way Jesus is, that is the way we are going to be. And the Bible says, whoever has this hope in him, purifies himself. Once you have the hope of eternal life, nobody needs to preach holiness to you. It's because you don't have eternal life as your goal. <laughs> it, it's not yet your goal. When it becomes your goal, nobody needs to tell you to be purified. It will come to you naturally because you know where you are going. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Hebrews chapter 13. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with, what, with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. If eternal life is your goal, contentment will come to you naturally. Covetousness will flee from you. It's because you've not made eternal life your goal. That's why you must watch and pray. Brethren, 
watch and pray that you may be accounted worthy to escape all the evils that are taking place on earth and more importantly that you may stand before the son of man do not envy the world be satisfied with what you have it may be small please be content be satisfied with what god has given you when god sees that you need more he will give you more we are not saying you are not going to work you will work you will work very well you will work very hard and god will bless the work of your hands but after you have done your best be satisfied with the result don't begin to copy the world you will get into trouble and god is calling you unto eternal life cultivate the spirit of christ that is your destiny study christ what are the things that made christ christ obedience submission love surrender to the will of the father in heaven those are the things god is calling you to do so that you can be like christ brethren i close this morning with this reminder simplify your life simplify your life be on the alert watch and pray god bless you you will not fall into the snare of the evil one in the mighty name of jesus christ amen